Techno-democracy is what I think may come after cryptocurrency. We go from magical internet money to magical internet votes. And this is just an example. Yeah, I'll show you a bunch of graphics in a second. A little I voted tchotchke, and the running example will be my friend Brian Johnson and how he might be able to actually start uh, a new party online. And you get an I voted sticker for him. So let me give motivation for this concept. What is techno-democracy? Why do we even want it? Then let's visualize it, look at actually like a concrete app example, and then how you might actually build this vision at the network school. So what comes after cryptocurrency? Well, right now, uh, you know, if anybody's paying attention to the Western world or the world at large, democratically elected leaders are very democratically unpopular. This is from a few months ago. A few of these leaders have already basically lost office. And um, this is something that it really doesn't matter what side one is on. You, you, you know, 49% is mad that the other 51% is winning and vice versa. Global dissatisfaction and democracy on all sides has actually just been ramping over the last several decades. And um, so, you know, if we ask the question, what's, what comes after cryptocurrency, the financial crisis of 2008 led to cryptocurrency. And in my view, the political crisis of 2024 will lead to techno-democracy. And just to, just to motivate this, um, you know, Ron Paul and end the Fed and that sentiment in the late 2000s and early 2010s led to Bitcoin. And that wasn't abandoning capitalism. It was, in a sense, revitalizing it and rebuilding it internet first. And the you know, declining confidence in our institutions, uh, now what we can do is actually rebuild democracy internet first. We've done it for capitalism with crypto. Now I think we're, we'll do it for, with, with democracy. And let me explain what I mean by that. So let's just jump right into a concrete example. So let's say that my you know, friend, collaborator, colleague, Brian Johnson, founded the Don't Die Party. OK? Um, and we'll use that to visualize a sample implementation. So here is like an example app that could be built on Farcaster, you know, Farcaster protocol. Um, and here is, a, you know, like a client he could build for it where you can sign up to the Don't Die Party. And basically, it looks at first glance a lot like, you know, Twitter, um, where in this case, you've got about 13,000 members of the Don't Die Party that have signed up. And um, if you uh, go uh, and, and look on the second tab, what you start to see is the ideological vector that defines this party and this group of people and how they differ from society at large. They're much more, in this case, pro-capitalist or pro-libertarian, pro-longevity than the population at large, okay? And you could imagine something like that for many different kinds of parties as I'll get to, but you start to quantify ideology and how it differs from the population at large based on survey responses. This is what this party stands for. What, why does it exist? And so let's say you actually went and applied to the Don't Die Party. What would happen in this you know, hypothetical concept of techno-democracy? So it actually have three parts to it. First, you would follow not just the president of the party, but the VP and the treasurer, okay? You'd essentially have, you'd follow the party leaders, okay? The second thing you do is um, you would fund the party and you'd basically pay, for example, party dues. This just by itself makes it much more serious than typical political parties today because it actually makes demands on one's time and energy. And in return for this funding, you get, in this case, blueprint olive oil, uh, a membership NFT, and you also start to attend events and the funds are used for organizing uh, party events. But the most important and the most technically interesting is this, the, the franchise. You actually vote for the slate um, of all of these candidates, and you give them limited but real permissions over your crypto wallet. So in this example, just like OAuth or just like wallet permissions, you flip some sliders and you say, okay, I'm voting for them for president, VP, and treasurer. I'm committing to follow norms, and I'm joining their Discord community, for example, and committing 100 bucks. And if I violate those norms, they can slash those 100 bucks, for example. And to be clear, this is kind of like, you know, Bitcoin started at, it was just play internet money. It was like, it didn't start at where it is today, which is a you know, trillion dollar market cap. It, it basically started at one cent when it finally got a price. So the first techno-democratic elections of this kind are like running for dog catcher. They're the most 
you know, limited, simple kinds of things you could imagine, but you are giving this leader limited power over your crypto wallet. And just to explain what that is, um, this limited yet binding grant of permissions over your wallet to a digital party is everything. From that single primitive, you can rebuild so much. And you've actually done this already, right? You do this all the time. Um, when you give wallet permissions, right, you are basically saying, OK, here is my, let's say, Ethereum account. Here is a third party app. I'm trusting Ethereum, the blockchain, to give limited permissions over my wallet to this app for the greater good. Um, you also do this uh, off chain with something like OAuth, right? Like you give limited permissions over your property, your digital property, to a third party app for the greater good, right? And if you think about this, this is actually very structurally similar to voting for somebody for office. You're saying, I want this person to have some power over me, for example, some ability to tax, some ability to regulate, and so on and so forth. I will give up some of my assets, some of my control, but I think it'll be for the greater good. I'll be able to allocate public goods for, for everybody's benefit, right? It's actually more like, you know, for example, joining a company and signing a contract than the typical uh, vote, which is not binding on either side, as we'll get to. Like a typical campaign promise is not binding, but um, something like this is, okay? So just going forward a little bit, basically, um, the innovation is delegating permissions not to a third party app, but a new digital party, right? From a third party app to a third party, or a fourth or a fifth, right? And uh, you get your vote receipt, like your NFT, your on chain thing. It's a cryptographically verifiable vote, which you can prove you joined. You can see who others joined. And any third party can verify that these are real people rather than bots. It's proof by running proof of human. You can view everybody on either scan who voted for, for your party. And you can actually prove to the world that this polity exists. Nobody can deny, and this is borderless, just like cryptocurrency is. So the old borders don't matter. You can actually put together a party of like mind and actually start rebuilding polities. One of the things that you do when you join a party like this is you attend party events. That's where the budget is going towards. So you've got something in Chicago, you've got something in Amsterdam, you have something in Bombay, and you attend those events. In these cases, like longevity meetups or workouts. So let me discuss a few key concepts behind tech democracy and why we should expect it now. So everything else is online. You know, in 1990, for example, people, you know, you were sending still physical mail, you were using cash. Today, 99% of transaction and communication is online. But elections and legislation aren't yet fully online. They are, however, partially online. If we think about um, how institutional voting works in, in Western democracies, it actually has three parts. Take, for example, someone like uh, my, my, my friend Vivek. Um, he has the Twitter vote. He gains millions of followers. He has the fundraising vote. He gets millions of dollars. And then there's the fiat off-chain vote where there's actual vote itself. And these three things are different races that correlate with each other, but they're not exactly the same. So parts of existing voting are online. And conversely, online voting also exists. Internet voting also exists. There's at least three kinds of internet votes. There's the daily Reddit or Twitter or, or Hacker News or whatever upvotes that determine what goes viral. There's DAO votes that determine how many millions of dollars are allocated out of a treasury. And then finally, Estonia actually does internet voting where they use uh, the equivalent of hardware wallets to do cryptographically secure online voting. And so how did Estonia carry out the world's first mostly online national elections? So the technology and the precedents are there. A lot of what we're doing in terms of leader selection is happening online, but it's kind of in the PayPal era before Bitcoin. We haven't taken that final leap of putting the settlement layer on, on chain. And that's the step, right? You go, the same technology that securely sends one coin can securely log one vote, right? That's really the core concept. We move the settlement layer on chain, and you move it from fiat to, to crypto. 
And so that's why the digital vote that I'm talking about is binding. It's not a LARP. And the reason is crypto wallets control real resources. So if you have a million crypto wallets whose partial control is pledged to a political leader with proof of consent and some time limitation on it and so on, then you've got real resources. And we know this in this audience, but I'll just enumerate it. You can think of there being four phases of digital governance, from discords to DAOs to doors to drones, right? So discords, that's just transactions. You know, the, the crypto wallets that you possess give access to a discord, access to messaging. DAOs, your crypto wallet can give collectively voting power over a DAO and allocate millions of dollars. But that's just the digital world. The next step is the physical world. So this is um, an NFT smart lock uh, uh, project where your Ethereum wallet unlocks a physical door, right? This exact same prompt of, you know, like approve this transaction turns a physical lock. Now, of course, if you think about that, that's the, that's the door to a hotel room, but that could be the door to your car, that could be the door to a crane, to a plane, to a truck, to anything, any piece of capital equipment, any, anything stationary, anything you know, that's capital equipment. And they extend it one step further, and this is the keys to the humanoid robots. These are the keys to the self-driving car. These are the keys to the drones. Basically, this can script the physical world, right? That's where we're going over the next five to 10 years. One, one, way, one thing people don't really think about too much, but it's very important, is most Web2 systems get hacked, but Web3 systems don't. So the control plane for drones, for self-driving cars, or anything that's really important will eventually go on chain. And your private key is anything if it's really important, like your car is really important to you, then if it's digitally controlled, then that'll be on chain. It'll be part of your crypto wallet. The crypto wallet becomes primary in a real sense. So the, the point is that if you have um, a million people and, uh, you know, for example, access to their premises, you know, in what sense, when do they give access to their premises? Well, only um, they grant a wallet permission, and only under these conditions can you search their premises or what have you. You can start thinking or, or, uh, about uh, a number of different ways where you can take millions of people's crypto assets and start aggregating them into a digital polity. And so that means crypto wallets can control real resources, not a LARP. It'll be thought of as a LARP for a long time, just like Bitcoin was a LARP for a long time. Again, you'll start with elections for dog catcher, but it can really reach unlimited you know, levels of resources over time. Now let me go through some key features and then wrap up with how we make this reality. So first, as I mentioned, it's, this is a cryptographically verifiable vote, right? Every vote counts because you can count all the votes. The same technology we use to verify blockchains, you can literally download things, you can run a script over it. As people have less trust in elections, we restore trust in elections. It's a streaming vote, very, very important. Basically, you know, there's not like one Twitter day where people, you know, over 24 hours can just go and follow you on Twitter. Instead, when they feel like it, they click the button and they follow, right? And so right now, we're in this weird transitional era where it used to be election day, for example, in many countries. And then it's become election period, which is this weird hybrid where you have mail order ballots and so on. Now we can just move to purely streaming elections where if you want to pledge support to a candidate for a year or two years or five years, you can just do so. It's a streaming vote. You just start accumulating support, right? You don't have to wait till the in-person fiat offline thing. Next, a social smart contract. So this is a portmanteau of you know, Rousseau and, and you know, the uh, Nick Sabo and Vitalik's work. Um, but basically, it's the social contract and the smart contract as one thing. It is uh, something where the rights of the, of the governed are clearly enumerated. You're not opting in to something, you're not consenting to something that you didn't consent to, basically. The, the same technology that's there to make smart contracts legible, to make sure they're not hacking you, we can leverage all of that to bring consent to political governance. And in, in fact, we can give provably limited government. There's a maximum tax rate, for example. Like, when you opt into this polity, it can only take, in this case, 100 bucks out of your wallet. It can't take 1,000 bucks, right? All these kinds of things, permissions, we've built for, you know, like crazy crypto things, but we can now start to use them for uh, governance. Truly universal franchise. So anybody from anywhere can vote from anyone. Right, we use the power of the internet, just like crypto. Anybody can send money to anyone. Anybody 
can pledge to anyone. You just bust all the old legacy borders that were written by colonial empires or that don't really map to people anymore, and now you actually say, our internet community is actually primary and the physical is secondary. Just like everybody in this room, how many countries are there? But they're all into the same stuff ideologically. Moreover, and this is even more important in some ways, truly universal candidacy. You know, for example, in the U.S. only, uh, you have to be 35 years old and a natural born citizen to be president of the U.S. So uh, Elon couldn't be president. Many immigrant founders couldn't be president. So only maybe 2% of the world, four, the U.S. is 4% of the world, half of that could be president of the U.S. But if 2% of the world could be president of the United States, 100% of the world could become president of a network state. They could hold a techno-democratic election, build a party, build legitimacy online, show that millions of people from around the world verifiably voted for them and gave these permissions to them, and you can build a new country in the cloud. And then you, you, you get land on the earth, right? So this is the, the way that we actually form the state of the network state. Truly new polities. So right now, you, you know, democracy is about the denominator, that is to say, you know, let's say you get 51% of the vote. Okay, but what's the denominator? What did you divide by? That's a fraction, right? And that fraction, the denominator, is um, usually all the people who live in that physical jurisdiction near you, which could be gerrymandered and look really weird if you look at it on the map. Here, we just throw out those legacy denominators, and instead we say the denominator is everybody who's opted in, right? You can form a new polity that's non-geographical that actually reflects people's consent. And um, Another thing you can have, you never have to ask, okay, who's the president, who's in charge, what powers does this bureaucrat have, and so on and so forth. These can be permission grants, just like in Google Docs, you grant edit access, view access, and that's actually a digital right that you can grant, audit, revoke, and so on. All of that can now be done for, you know, what rights does the treasurer have over the community's wallet that can be audited, that can be tracked, right? A few more features. This is 100% democracy as opposed to 51% democracy. In 51% democracy, it's like the barest level of legitimacy. A candidate wins and 49% of people are mad at them. And then a few more years later, it goes 49, 51 the other way. And that's just a recipe for instability and discontent, right? The whole point of democracy is the consent of the governed. And now we get to 100% consent. Just like a company, literally nobody is part of this party slash network unless they want it to be there, right? Like nobody is working at a tech company unless they want to be there, and it's double opt-in every single day. The CEO wants you there, and the employee wants to be there, and th those both parties are there. Same for this. It's 100% democracy in that sense. So it, it maximizes consensus, but it also protects minority rights because it's 0.1% democracy. A tiny, tiny group of people can form a new political party, digital party. So a few more examples of what technical democracy enables. Um, you, I just talked about the don't die party, but you can imagine, oops, it's not working. Ah, there we go. The Mars party, okay, so Elon uh, could form the Mars party and this could focus on exploring Mars, right? And that's making content, making movies, thinking about terraforming, all this stuff, right? The open source AI party, um, Daniel Ek or Donnie Ak, as I made in this image, could advocate for, for this and, and building these things. So you can imagine movement-focused new parties. And you don't necessarily need to call them parties. You can call them collectives or, or organizations. But in short, techno-democracy takes us from the two-party to the end-party system. It could reopen political innovation. And note that in all of this, I haven't talked at all about contesting fiat elections. Leave that for basically the indefinite future. Just first build these things online. Finally, just in terms of execution, if you want to build this, go and apply at the network school, ns.com apply. We accept our first class, but we're going to be, uh, we have rolling applications online and we'll accept more probably starting in October or so as we scale capacity. Um, so thank you very much.